Okay, some days there's a balance in the universe, guys, and uh, I, I just, somebody sent me this video from Dr. Stephen Gundry, and I made a mistake of clicking on it and watching it. My, my, literally, my head was like going to explode listening to the absolute nonsense this guy is promulgating. I mean, it's just like, you put the crack pipe down, dude. I mean, I don't know what the heck he's doing. So anyway, let's, let's talk. <laughs> Let's uh, let's get into that. For that, I, you know, just a few other updated things I think are of interest. You know, this is just a uh, success story. This is current work, Granny Donna Donna Laura Leach, uh, who features on my Instagram every once in a while. She's out there busting out, you know, 200 push-ups in under 20 minutes. She's doing strict pull-ups now. She, I mean, she's just kicking ass as a 72-year-old grandma. Uh, you know, on a carnivore diet now for two years. She's gotten rid of her psoriasis, arthritis, depression, and now she's just kicking ass. Anyways, this is a success story. You should check it out. So she's using a combination of a little bit of fasting and, um, you know, carnivore diet. And she goes on to say, yes, I fast. Yes, I'm carnivore. 72 year old carnivore granny. And I find if I exercise in a fasted state, I build more muscle by burning fatty acids and ketones for fuel and being fat adapted, 72 years old, and hopefully no sarcopenia. I fast on an 18-6-16-8 schedule, eat nothing after an evening meal, and eat when hungry the next day. That may be noon, mid-afternoon, or later. My longest fast, 48 hours. Thankful for Sean Baker, 1967. That'd be me and Dr. Jason Fung. Donna, 72-year-old carnivore granny. And this is a picture of her, you know, showing off the guns. So, uh, good for her. Okay, um... You know, BMI, not the best measure. There, you know, waist to height ratio. Let's talk about that a little bit. Waist to height ratio is an excellent um, metric to assess health. I mean, it, it, it represents whole body obesity and probably more importantly, visceral adipose tissue more than any other sort of convenient measure you can do outside of advanced imaging and things like that. So let's... Look at this little article, 2017, waist to height ratio more accurate than BMI in identifying obesity. New study shows, and the alarming thing about this, and I wanna say uh, that the, the, the thing that was probably most striking for me is as the research read by Dr. Michelle Swainson, senior lecturer at the Exercise Physiology in Carnegie School of Sport in Leeds Beckett, found that 36.5% more adults would be classified as obese using whole body fat data rather than body mass index, which would go from one in seven participants being classified as obese to one in two. So you would, you know, you would incredibly incre increase the amount of people can be classified as obese because of the waist to height measurement. And that's what we're seeing clinically uh, out there. And so this is something I think is uh, very, uh, very interesting. So explains the claims conventional measurement of BC used by GPs at BMI, although there are benefits to this method, there is concern that a lot of people are being classified as obese by BMI when they are not or being missed by this classification when they are, need to be referred to for help. This is most definitely the case when people have normal BMI, but high abdominal fat is often dismissed. Whole body fat percentage, specific, specifically VAT or visceral adipose tissue mass, are associated with health conditions including insulin resistance, Type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease that are not fully accounted for through the BMI evaluation. So BMI is, an, is a pretty poor tool overall. I mean, it's a screening tool, but you got to look much beyond that. Um, the uh, carrying fat around the abdominal area has been shown to be an independent predictor of all-cause mortality in men and women. Put simply, it is more important, especially for cardiomyopathy metabolic conditions, that your belt notch goes down more than the reading on the scale. The results show that the best predictor of both whole body fat percentage and visceral adipose tissue in both men and women was waist to height ratio. The simple waist circumference divided by the height measurement is not a new method of obesity classification, but despite evidence supporting its use, it is still not routinely measured in clinical settings. The cut points for predicting whole body obesity, 0.53 in women, or sorry, in men, and 0.54 in women. The cut point for predicting abdominal obesity was 0.59 in both sex, the sexes. And so BMI has weak support. Um, the waist to hip ratio is, re is measured regularly by fitness instructors using, is, and used in clinical practice by which, but which was also found to be a very poor predictor. So waist to height, not waist to, waist to hip ratio, waist to height ratio. So there is a little chart here uh, you, can, you can look at um, that shows, you know, kind of that waist to height zone. And so, Basically, without putting up the chart here, 
um, you want your waist to height ratio, you know, be around about 0.45 to 4.7, somewhere in there. And between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, it's probably reasonable. If you get too lean, you know, you get this fruitarian skin, that's also not as healthy there. It's kind of a kind of a U-shaped curve there. Uh, most of the bad stuff is at the fat end, but there is, you know, as you get too skinny there, the mortality uh, and problematic issues goes up. So right in that 4.5 range is good. Uh, mine, if you look at me, I'm 77 inches tall, six foot five, and my waist is 35 inches. And so that puts me at 0 0.45, so right, right where you want to be. And you measure the waist not at your belt. It's not your, your, your pants size. It's your waist, which is you know, top of your iliac crest. For most people, it's you know, umbilicus or the belly button. For some people with a really big belly, it sags down. you got to kind of measure above that. So just top of the, top of the, top of the iliac crest, you, know, you fill that on the side and just kind of run your tape measure around there or use your belly button. And that's gonna be a pretty pretty good predictor. So find that out, that's what you guys should be looking at. All right, let's get into this friggin' plant paradox, Stephen Gundry insanity. So here's a little clip of him talking about protein requirements. How much protein you need to eat is, uh, I think, fairly well settled by researchers in longevity, like uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Walter Longo. And if you've noticed in my books, both the plant paradox and the longevity paradox, I use his formulas to calculate the amount of protein, a normal, what's called a 70 kilogram man, 150 pound man, would usually need to eat. And it comes down, simply put, to probably about 20 to 30 grams of protein per day. Okay, as you can see, 20 to 30 grams of protein a day um, is what he's recommending for an average 150 pound person. So if you weigh more, you're gonna get a little bit more, but even at that size, even at 150, that is unconscionably low. I mean, it's ridiculous that anyone would, would, would promote that. And he's you know, using the work of Walter Longo, Walter Longo, my hero, right? To, uh, to sort of prop this up and I will tell you, uh, I'll get into the criticism of that first of all, but here's another sort of clip. Can we tell where, why don't you need so much protein? Let's talk about that. Is we actually recycle all of the protein that's in the lining of our gut wall. And we tend to sh shed most of our gut wall almost daily, at least every other day, all the cells lining our gut wall are kicked out and a new one replaces them we don't waste those cells, so we actually eat those cells. Mucus that, you know, your runny nose, the mucus in the back of your throat are mucopolysaccharides. They're sugar molecules with protein, and we actually digest that mucus. So we actually have a continuous source of protein within us that can make up for a lot of the protein we assume we need on an everyday basis. Okay, apparently sucking down snot and sloughed off cells is gonna get you all the protein you need, man. You're on the snot and dead cell diet. You know, I mean, I, well, what about all the skin cells that fall off? You know, what about the fact that when you have a bowel movement, the majority of the, the content in the bowel movement is actually cells that have been sloughed off. You know, this is what happens with a carnivore diet, all that is, is going to be sloughed off bacteria and in, 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 in epithelial, GI epithelial cells. And so we don't, that we crap it out. We don't eat all of it. So, I mean, he's, I mean, first of all, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you know, you know it's not many chew your toenails too. Chew your, chew your fingernails, toenails, suck down snot, and, uh, you know, you slough off cells. That's where you're going to get your protein from. You know, there, there is no human credible data on this stuff that, that shows that. I mean, he, he references some study that's just, refuted multiple times by many necessarily. And Walter Longo says, as I've pointed out many times, see the criticism by, by Don Lehman, Stu Phillips, and others. I mean, the study he did, you know, looking at human, uh, you know, human protein requirements in midlife was just a botched, bizarre, absolute misrepresentation of the NHANES data where he cherry-picked it through, uh, you know, didn't, didn't use all the data, excluded what didn't fit for him. I mean, it's crazy, you know, and, and you know, uh, in this video, <laughs> Stephen Gundry goes on to say that 
high pro and the title of this video is X fact the fact that a high protein diet, pro protein diet turns into fat basically all that ex extra if you eat any extra protein beyond your 20 to 30 grams a day it all turns into fat i mean clearly this is going on with me right i'm mean, look at this i'm just i'm just loaded with fat from all this protein i'm eating my god you know i'm i'm in the freaking leanest shape of my life and i'm eating three four hundred grams of protein a day the guy is bonkers okay let's go let's 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 see some of the some of the uh, stuff from guys like Stu Phillips who are the top guys in the world when it comes to uh, you know uh, protein this is this these are guys that actually do it and so um, he comments on even Longo's own work shows that higher protein intakes are beneficial for older persons of persons effectively punching a hole in his own theory that paper was also by the record for the record badly flawed and this is the one that Gundry is rep uh, uh, referencing. Um, he goes on, there needs to be an appreciation of real human data. And he, and he has a bunch of different references. The RDA is flawed and too low for older people in general. The preponderance of evidence shows very clearly that the protein intake beyond the RDA are associated with greater outcomes, uh, greater uh, health. Even along with his own work shows that higher protein intakes are beneficial for older, older people. All right, so that's, um, you know, what Stu Phillips has to say. A couple of these papers that... that, that Heat sites and some other ones that are there. You know, this is one uh, 2016 protein requirements beyond the RDA implication for optimizing health. Uh, the the uh, sort of catch kept the uh, conclusion here. Despite persistent beliefs to the contrary, contrary, we can find no evidence based the link between higher protein diets and renal disease or adverse bone health. This brief synopsis highlights recent learnings based on presentations at the 2015 Canadian Nutrition Society Conference across protein nutrition across the lifespan. Current evidence indicates intakes in the range of at least 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilo per day of high quality protein is a more ideal target for achieving optimal outcomes in adults. Um, you know, this uh, study here uh, is protein intake greater than the RDA differentially influences whole body lean mass Response to a purposeful at catabolic and anabolic stressors, a systematic review of meta and a meta analysis by Josh Hudson in 2020. And it says protein intakes greater than the RDA beneficially, beneficially influence changes in lean mass when adults were purposely stressed by catabolic stressors of dietary energy restriction with and without anabolic stressors of resistance training. The RDA for protein is adequate to support lean mass in adults during non-stress states. This review is registered at blah, blah, blah. So the RDA is designed for something that doesn't move. I mean, and, it, and it's, you know, that's like 0.8 grams per kilogram, and that's still woefully low. I mean, if you're going to actually do stuff, like actually actually move and do things, then you need much more protein. So perhaps Dr. Gundry is, you know, doesn't even support walking on the treadmill with a bobblehead like Dr. Rieger does. Maybe you just sit there. You just sit there, and you don't move. You can do that 20 grand. Just eat your, uh, eat your snot that sucks down and eat your... Uh, your uh, sloughed off skin cells. Protein supplementation improves lean body mass in physically active older adults, randomized placebo controlled trial. Uh, what do they got to say? Uh, conclusion physically active older adults with relatively low habitual dietary protein consumption and improvement in physical performance and increase in lean body mass and a decrease in fat mass were observed after walking exercise training. A larger increase in relative lean body mass and a larger reduction in fat mass were observed in participants, participants receiving. 12 weeks of daily protein supplementation compared with controls, where this was not accompanied, by differences in improvement in groups and muscle strength and physical performance. So if you want to just sit on your ass and not do anything, uh, you may not need as much protein, but you still need more than 20 freaking grams a day. High, alert, high versus low dietary protein intake and bone health in older adults systematic review and meta-analysis. A higher fem femoral net, okay, uh, blah, blah, blah. Meta-analysis of four cohort studies showed that higher protein intake results in a significant decrease in hip fractures. Tell that to Dr., uh, what's his name? Uh, Dr. McDougal falls down in his bathroom, <laughs> breaks his hip. Poor guy. Uh, has a ratio of 0.89, confident interval 8.4 to 9.4. The systematic review supports the protein intake above the current RDA, which is still far. It's like, you know, double what Gundry wants you to do. Uh, supports that protein intake above the current RDA may reduce hip fracture risk and may play a beneficial role in bone mineral density maintenance and loss in older adults. So 
Dr. Gundry wants you to fall down and break your hip, I guess. I don't know. That's crazy, crazy advice. Okay, finally, he has one other thing. He, you know, he goes off on his tangent about new 5G6, which I'm not going to get into. It's malarkey. It's BS, associational garbage, mechanistic garbage. It doesn't have any human data to support it. All right, let's, let's go look at his final uh, statement here. The point of all this is there is no evidence of long-living people on a carnivore diet. Sorry, find one. I'll be happy to, to take it back. There is none. Okay, find a human population in which a carnivorous diet or meat-heavy diet results in a longer life. Well, here you go, Sammy. We're the same. Sammy are reindeer herders living up in circumpolar regions of Scandinavia, Norway, Finland, uh, Sweden. Studies showing that their life expectancy was greater than the reference population who lived near them. And what do they live on? They live on reindeer, caribou, a little bit of fish, occasionally a few berries here and there. But, but their diet is pr primarily high protein, high fat, very low carbohydrate. They outlive their neighbors that live on a more omnivorous diet, a lower protein diet. So there you go. There's one right there. Life expectancy, 81 uh, for the females and 75 for the males above the, the, the reference range. All right, I've talked about Hong Kong several times, 2017, 2018, longest people in the world, I haven't checked on in a while. Well, guess what, 2020 projections. Who's top of the list for life expectancy again? Who is it? It's Hong Kong, 84. These guys live longer than anyone on the entire friggin' planet, anyone. And guess what, what's their meat consumption? Oh my, highest among any people on the planet, including beef and pork, things with new 5G6, ooh, new 5, you know, whatever, or new 5GC rather. So again, Gundry is get off the crack pipe. You know, maybe too many lectins affected your brain. Uh, this recommendation to eat 20 grams of protein a day or suck on your snot and eat your uh, intestinal, you know, you might as well be a breatharian. Maybe we need to be breatharians and get all of our nutrients from there. You know, well, we make metabolic water. We don't need to drink it, you know. Our body can make glucose. Why would we need to eat any? You know, uh, all that protein is going to, and this is the other thing he makes protein will turn into glucose via gluconeogenesis, which will then turn into fat. The efficiency of turning protein into glucose via gluconeogenesis, in theory, at best, 50 grams per 100, not about not even 50, but 35 to 55, about 50 percent, maybe even less. Isotopic data on that stuff, when they've actually looked at it, shows it's far less than that. So you're not, if you're worried about glucose turning into fat, don't eat carbohydrates, guys. You know, and I'm not saying that, but if that argument about protein turning into fat via gluconeogenesis, yeah, look at me, look how freaking fat I am. Oh my God, I'm, I'm a lard ass. Christ. Anyway, this guy's a nut. Anyway, you guys, and, and, and people, you know, buy his books and buy his stupid supplements. Anyway, buy everywhere. Don't listen to these crackpots. Um, anyway, have a good day. Eat some damn steak. Go out there, exercise, resistance training. These are the keys. It's not this BS the vegan clowns are selling you guys. All right, the plant-based clowns are selling you guys. Don't fall for the stuff. All right, have a great day. We'll see you in the next video. Take care.